And so I will present uh, the work that we did uh, in the recent years about how to use spin waves as state variable for, for novel computing. Uh, for, for novel computing. And it's a, it's a work that is a joint work between uh, different labs. So the main uh, players are C2N, so my lab, and IMEC in Belgium with the PhD student uh, Giacomo Talmeli uh, and, uh, and the PI Christophe Adelman. Where in, in my lab, it's uh, two, two postdocs, Umesh Pascar and Manu Susru, that have been the main contributors. Um, so this is the outline of my talk. Uh, I will start by explaining briefly uh, or recalling uh, for most of you what spin waves are and what are their main features and why we are interested in spin waves. And then I'll split my talk into three parts. One about the classical methods that are used to measure spin waves, so essentially the past. Okay, and then I will focus in the second part on a, on a technique that is called uh, uh, propagating spin wave spectrometry, so dedicated to the measurement of the propagation properties of, of spin waves. And uh, in the last part, I will use uh, the knowledge that we've acquired concerning the, the spin wave dispersion relations to harness spin waves to make interferometry experiment and applications to, to logic gates. Okay, so, um, so spin waves. Um, so spin waves, me move this screen. I, I, I can't move this screen. Okay, up. Uh, so spin waves are are the eigen excitations of magnetization in in a magnetic material. So the typical situation is you have an equilibrium magnetization, so parallel to the effective field in the system, and at some if at some moment you you perturb the system and you put the magnetization out of equilibrium like this green arrow then magnetization will start to precess okay um, and as magnetization precesses and since this spin is not isolated it's coupled to its neighbors in fact uh, this this excitation will be will will propagate to the neighbors okay and so you will create a wave of precessing magnetization with a given wavelengths and a given frequency. So uh, spin waves are, are interesting for applications for, for two important facts. It's first of all, these are eigen excitations li that lie in the gigahertz range. So from a few gigahertz to a few times 10 gigahertz. Okay. And in this, in this frequency band, you can have spin waves that have either zero wave vector or very large wave vectors. So you can, in this frequency band, you can use spin waves that have wavelengths of the order of several microns to deep in the submicron regime while still keeping, in, uh, keeping the, the band in, in the same frequency range. So these gigahertz frequency and micron scales make spin waves interesting for, for RF integrated circuits. But beyond that, they have specific properties that other waves may not possess. And for instance, uh, these, the spin waves are very anisotropic in their propagation characteristics. Uh, their dispersion relations are very, tu very easily tunable. So for instance, if I apply a magnetic field, uh, then the spin wave dispersion relations will go up Okay, depending on the amplitude or, or will go down if I change the orientation of the magnetic field. So they are easily tunable. Uh, uh, and some other features is that they are very easily put into the nonlinear regime. Okay. So spin waves, um, they can be interesting wave for wave computing, uh, but what the, 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 big, the main problem with spin waves at the moment, it's, it's difficult to generate spin waves in an energy efficient way and to measure spin waves uh, in, in, in a practical way. So most of the research that is done in the group I belong to uh, at C2N is to study methods, uh, either electrical or magneto-optical methods to generate, collect and, and harness the properties of, of spin waves for, for computing devices. So uh, magnetic materials are anisotropic. That is to say, usually in a magnetic material, uh, it's easy to magnetize in one direction and much more difficult to magnetize in other directions. Okay. And since the magnetic materials are very anisotropic, spin waves are also very anisotropic. 
Um, so depending on the direction of the magnetization with respect to the sample geometry, so here a thin film, you will have very different dispersion relations. But in addition, uh, because of the dipole-dipole interactions that are also very anisotropic, uh, the spin wave dispersion relations will depend a lot on the orientation between the spin wave wave vector and the magnetization. So as a result, uh, spin waves in magnetic materials comes with, with, uh, with several flavors. Okay, And we will mostly uh, in this talk use the magnetostatic surface modes that sometimes are called also the Daman bar waves uh, in, in single films. So spin waves are an isotropic. Uh, and spin waves are generally more complicated than simple plane waves for, for many different reasons. And I'll just show one of them, which is the, the dipole-dipole interaction. Um, so to illustrate how dipole-dipole interactions are important, I will here show a cross section of a film. So this is a film that whose magnetization is pointing towards you. Uh, so imagine you have a spin wave uh, in this film and the spin wave is propagating to the right then uh, you have a dynamic magnetization pattern that looks like that, okay, such that the magnetization inside the sample is non-uniform. So if the magnetization is non-uniform, uh, and if it has a divergence, then you're going to have some magnetic charges, okay, so north poles here and south poles there at the region where the north pole of this arrow and the south pole of these arrows are not compensated. So so you will have volume magnetic charges inside the magnetic material. And in addition to these volume charges, you can see that here, for instance, this magnetization is pointing towards the interface of the film, which means that you also create surface charges at the two edges of the film. And now if you look at this situation where you both have volume charges and surface charges, you can see here that you have a cluster of plus charges that repel each other. While here you have minus charges that are attracted by this surface plus charge. So as a result, the, these plus charges wants to move up and these minus charges wants to move up also. So as a result of dipole interact, dipole dipole interactions, this type of wave tends to localize near the top surface of the film so that it transforms in fact into a surface wave, which has a mode profile uh, that is peaked uh, at the top interface. And this is related to the direction of propagations of the spin waves. So if you consider a spin waves moving to the left, where I, I did not show the magnetization pattern, but the, the, the mode profile will be opposite so that the wave will be localized to the bottom surface. So this, this can yield properties, well, susceptibilities that will be different for a left propagating mode and for a right propagating mode because of dipole-dipole interactions. And then generally, uh, there are additional complications if we work with thin films, because thin films have interfaces, and at interfaces, there are interface anisotropies that tend to pin the spins at, at the interfaces. Okay. So imagine you have a film whose top interface has some, some anisotropy and bottom interface has no anisotropy. Then once again, the, the spins are free to move uh, at the interface where there is no anisotropy, while they are not so free to move when there is interface anisotropy, so that now the spin waves tends to localize uh, near the interface that has the lowest interface anisotropy. And this is irrespective of the propagation direction of the spin wave. And so in practice, when you use a thin film, you have both dipole-dipole interactions and interface anisotropies, which tends to localize the, the wave near an interface or near the other with some dependence on the wave vector. So you can end up with complicated profiles within the thickness. And the result that one has to remember is that the frequencies of left propagating and right propagating spin waves might be substantially different and their susceptibilities might also be substantially different. Okay, so, so much for spin waves. They're interesting because they are in the gigahertz range with wavelengths that can be easily tuned uh, in the micron range. Okay, and their main features is that they are anisotropic, tunable, non-reciprocal, and non-linear. 
So, so these, these objects have been studied uh, a lot uh, in the past and, and a lot more now, okay, by several methods. And historically, to measure spin waves, people have used ferromagnetic resonance. And, and now ferromagnetic resonance adapted to the thin film geometry, which is called vector network analyzer ferromagnetic resonance. So the principle of, a, of measuring a spin wave with vector network analyzer ferromagnetic resonance is the following. You have a magnetic sample here with its magnetization in blue, and you just put this magnetic sample on top of an RF strip line. And so in this RF strip line, uh, it, this RF strip line has some characteristic impedance, which depends on the inductive uh, part, which has an inductive part and a capacitive part. And the inductive part of the strip line is affected by the fact that you have a magnetic sample on top with a finite permeability. So if you are able to measure uh, in a frequency result manner, the impedance of this ensemble, it contains the information about the magnetic susceptibility. Okay. And for instance, this is, this is one result that you can obtain on a nanometer thick uh, a cobalt iron layer. Okay. You can measure with this VNA fMR method the permeability versus the frequency. And uh, when you measure frequency, when you measure permeability versus frequency, it is resonant at the frequency of the spin waves that we are excited that we are exciting. And so uh, this resonance frequency informs us about the magnetic properties, so the applied field and the magnetic properties. And the line widths uh, of this resonance inform us about the lifetime of the spin waves that we have generated that is expressed essentially by a, a parameter, which is the Gilbert damping parameter. So, so people have been using a lot of ferromagnetic resonance uh, to, to measure spin waves. Uh, but it's only restricted to zero wave vector because in fact, uh, this strip line typically has a dimension that is above 10 microns so that the field that is generated is almost uniform. And so we almost only excite uh, the, the zero wave vector spin waves. So to, to circumvent that problems, uh, uh, and other methods have been developed and has become very popular, which is the Brillouin light scattering. So Brillouin's light scattering is a way to measure the spin wave properties by making them interact with photons. So the basic principle is that you send a photon to the magnetic sample. So the photon has an energy and a wave vector and the photon is able to interact with the spin wave. So either we to create a spin wave or to absorb the spin wave so that after this interaction, the scattered photon has a different wave vector because it has absorbed the wave vector of the spin wave and it has a different frequency because it has absorbed the energy of the spin wave. So this is, this is what Brillouin uh, Brill light scattering is. So uh, there are two processes that are important. One process is when this photon generate or create a spin wave Okay. And another one is when the spin waves annihilate a spin wave. In this case, the photon frequency decreases, uh, increases, sorry, while in the previous case, the, the photon frequency increases. So you can distinguish creation and annihilation of spin wave. And by looking at the deflection of the photons, you have an information of the spin wave wave vector. Uh, so, so to investigate different wave vectors, what is currently done is simply changing the geometry of the, of the scattering experiment. So by changing the orientation of the magnetic field with respect to the, to the layer of the beams, we can investigate lower or larger wave vectors. So this means that this method is, is, is good to measure wave vectors up to the, the diffraction limit of the optical photons that, that are used. And in practice, it's been, uh, this BLS method has been used a lot to construct the dispersion relations of spin waves, so frequency versus wave vector uh, in, the, in, the, in the range of a few wavelengths per, per micron. Okay, so these are the two popular, the most popular ways of measuring spin waves. There are many others, okay? We can cite, for instance, the magnetotransport measurements when we look, want to look at confined spin waves. 
But most of these uh, methods for measuring spin waves do not really measure the propagation characters, the propagation properties of the spin waves. Okay. Uh, so another method is much more accurate to look at the propagation. And this is the method that I will describe now, propagating uh, spin wave spectroscopy. Uh, OK, so propagating spin wave experiments. In fact, if, if we look back in the past, this is a work that has been uh, uh, pioneered uh, in your lab uh, in Claude Fermont's group by, uh, by a PhD student at uh, Mathieu Bayeul at that time, a, a long time ago. And uh, the basic principle of the experiment is the following. You start with some magnetic material. Okay. Uh, you magnetize the, this magnetic material using a, a strong applied field in, in one direction. Okay. Uh, and on top of this magnetic material, you pattern a microwave antenna. So you flow RF current into this microwave antenna and it generates RF fields. So this RF field below the antenna can excite the magnetization and so to create spin waves that will propagate away from this antenna until they can be collected in a receiving antenna. And these, these antennas are connected, uh, with, uh, connected to vector network analyzer for the analysis of the propagation. Uh, the, so the, the amplitude and the phase of the propagation, uh, the propagation coefficients of the, of the spin waves. So this typically, uh, this is implemented in samples that, that looks like that. And this typically yields a spectrum that look uh, as this curve. So you have a transmission coefficient here between uh, antenna two and antenna one versus, versus frequency. Uh, below a given frequency, there's absolutely no signal that is carried by the spin waves because uh, we are in the gap of the dispersion relation and there's no spin waves, uh, there's no existing spin waves. Then when the frequency is high enough, we are in the spin wave band where the density of state of spin waves is, is strong enough. So we have a transmission signal. Uh, and then it has a real part and an oscillating part. And I'll discuss that because this is related to the phase acquired by the spin waves upon propagation. And so now I will spend a few slides uh, trying to explain why we have this kind of transmission coefficients and, and what can we do with them to characterize the spin waves. So let's, in, before looking at transmission, let's look at the reflection of a single antenna. So imagine you have an antenna and you feed the antenna with an RF current at a given frequency omega zero. So at this given frequency, there's a number of spin waves that can respond and these spin waves may have different wave vectors. So to, uh, to look at the reflection coefficient, you need to integrate over all wave vectors, uh, all spin wave wave vectors. And then you also need to ensure that these spin waves will respond to the magnetic field. So you have to look at the susceptibility of these spin waves at, at, this, at the applied frequency. And the susceptibility typically looks like that. You have an imaginary peak that is resonant at the spin wave frequency and a real part uh, that, is, that has the, the shape of an, uh, an asymmetric uh, Lorentzian shape like this. So, so uh, for the reflection coefficient of the antenna, you need to have spin waves that respond, so that have a finite susceptibility. But you also need that the antenna is able to excite these spin waves. Okay? And so this depends on the antenna geometry. So for instance, imagine you have a U-shaped antenna like here, and you're flowing some RF current in this antenna. Then because of the RF current, it's gonna generate some RF magnetic field uh, which will have a given spatial profile in, in the direction that is scanned by, by my nails. Okay. And in fact, it has a vertical component here at the middle of the, of the U. So like as if the U-shaped antenna was a coil, a negative vertical field outside, like in this blue curve, whether the in-plane field is negative below the left antenna and positive uh, below the right antenna. So it has a given spatial profile. And if you look at its spectrum in, in reciprocal space, it means that the antenna will be efficient uh, or will be very efficient around the wave vector uh, 
that is typically related to the inverse of the, of the effective size of the antenna. Okay, uh, so to compute the reflection coefficient, we need the susceptibility of the sample and the excitation spectrum of the antenna. And as I told you, the excitation spectrum of the antenna not only contains the contribution at zero wave vector, but if you use a small antenna, it will contain contributions up to typically the inverse of the antenna size. So you will be able to excite the, the k equal to zero, but also the, finite, the, the spin waves at finite k's up to a given k value, so up to a given frequency. And so as a result, the reflection coefficients versus frequency will have this typical shape. So below a given frequency, we are in the spin wave gap. Uh, so in the spin wave gap where there's no existing spin waves, then above a, a given threshold, the density of states of the spin wave starts to be finite. Okay. Uh, and above, above a given frequency, then the antenna uh, uh, starts, to be, starts to be inefficient. So the reflection coefficient of the antenna related to the spin wave signal is typically an envelope that is zero somewhere and finite uh, in a given frequency interval. So, so much for the reflection coefficient. If we now look at the transmission coefficient, we have much more information because to, have a trans to transmit power using spin waves, not only we need to be able to excite them, so have a finite susceptibility and have the antenna that has the correct shape to, to excite these spin waves, but upon propagation, the spin wave will deface in space. So if they propagate along a distance r and they have a k vector k, then they will deface by this uh, exponential factor with the k being directly linked uh, with the frequency of the, of the spin wave, uh, thanks to the dispersion relation. So the reflection coefficient was some kind of boring with just a, just a peak around a, in a given frequency band. Uh, but instead, if instead of looking at the reflection, now we look at the transmission, then there's this propagation induced defacing uh, that is frequency dependent because the frequency changes the K vector. So that the transmission signals will typically look like oscillatory signals uh, that indeed reflect the increase of the K vector uh, when, we, when we increase the frequency. So if I summarize uh, what we expect when we do a propagating spin wave experiment, if we assume that there's only one spin wave band, okay, uh, then the response uh, versus frequency is gonna be contained in an envelope that is essentially given by the antenna geometry. And with this, within this envelope, we ha will have the reflection coefficient that will be complex with a real part and an imaginary part that are in quadrature and rotate at a pace that is directly informative of the K vector. So you see here that we measure at a given frequency and we have a phase that is related to the K vector. So you, you, imagine, you immediately see that with this type of measurements, we will be able to construct the dispersion relation, that is to say the relation between frequency and wave vector for the, for the spin waves. And this is the purpose at, of, of what will come next. So we expect this type of signals, and if indeed we measure it, so for instance, uh, if we use a, a cobalt iron stripe, typically five micron wide with a thickness in the range of 30, 30 nanometer. If we place several antennas on top of it, uh, we can measure the, ref the transmission between antenna one and antenna two, antenna one and antenna three and so on. So we can vary the propagation distance. And if we look at the signal versus the propagation distance, so two, four, and six microns, you see that indeed what changes is the rate at which the phase varies with the frequency, which expresses simply the fact that if we increase the propagation distance, in fact, we increase the rate at which the phase rotates uh, after at, at the receiving antenna. So what you can see is that the, the physical signal that you see in experiment uh, are, are easy to interpret and resembles very reasonably to the expectations uh, of, of simple models. Okay, um, so now I'll show that 
in fact, it is not as simple as that because it's very difficult in experiment to excite only one spin wave band. Uh, in fact, there's a, there are several bands of spin waves and we will see that other, other bands can contribute to the signal. And this is what we'll, I will show now by doing transverse wave vector spectroscopy. So coming back again to this experimental result, which uh, seems if you don't, if you look from far away, it seems that the 1D single mod model works fine. Okay. But in fact, if you have a closer look, you will see additional ripples here. And I want to emphasize that these ripples are not experimental artifacts. They are real. And sometimes if you work at low field, yeah. you see them very clearly. Okay, so let, let's go back to this slide where I was showing that when we consider only one spin wave band, uh, we apparently fail to describe the, the very fine details of what happens at, at low frequencies. And in fact, the reason is the following. So here is a micromagnetic simulation. That is to say that the blue and red uh, are uh, positive and negative amplitudes of, 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 of magnetization dynamics in a space resolved manner. Okay. And what I do at the beginning of this simulation is I have my antenna here on top of a stripe who's, where the magnetization is at rest. I excite magnetization dynamics. So what you see is that indeed you seem to propagate waves. Okay. Uh, so the waves that we've discussed so far are this alternation of red, blue, red, blue, that attenuates, as you can see, uh, as they propagate. But you see that the, the micromagnetic pattern is in fact much more complex. And we excite a lot of other spin waves. So we excite spin waves in the direction transverse to the stripe. Okay, and we also have a more complicated profile that is better seen here, uh, where we typically see that away from the antenna, so that's the antenna, away from the antenna, uh, we excite a main mode, but also another mode that has the same frequency, but obviously a different wavelength so that you have some kind of beating when you go away from, from the antenna. So in fact, with inductive antenna, we excite a lot of spin waves, okay? Uh, for some of them, we're not sensitive to them, and, uh, but for, for many of them, we're, we are still sensitive to them. And so uh, what I want to, to show now is how to make an experiment and try to select only one spin wave mode uh, purposely. Okay. And for this, I need to make a parenthesis and, and talk about how we calculate the response of the sample uh, in the time domain. So, so far, everything that I've been showing was measured in the frequency domain. So I was using two antenna, one input, one output. I was sending a frequency at the input and measuring the same frequency at the output. And then I was changing the frequency in order to, re to reconstruct a, a, a transmission spectrum versus frequency. So that's one of the, the spectrum that I've been showing so far. Uh, in fact, we are dealing with wave. Okay, and uh, if you know the property of a linear system for every frequency, you can calculate the response of this system to any stimulus given in the time domain. So if, you, if indeed you can measure the properties of your sample from zero frequency to infinite frequency, so in practice to frequencies much above the highest spin wave available in this system. So in our case, uh, we're measuring up to 70 gigahertz. Then uh, by mathematical calculation, in fact, you can reconstruct the response to any time domain stimulus. And for instance, the response to an impulse function, that is to say uh, the fictitious experiment where you would apply a gigantic pulse here at the input, gigantic, but still staying in the linear domain of excitation. And then you would excite a bunch of spin waves that would propagate to the receiving antenna. And you would have a very sensitive oscilloscope here uh, that would record uh, 
uh, the time resolved response uh, here at the receiving antenna. So by doing these kinds of experiments, you would be able to excite many spin waves and the fast spin waves would arrive first while the slower spin wave would take a longer time to arrive. Okay. So this is done simply by, uh, by Fourier transforming uh, the data that you measure at, at, at all frequencies. So by Fourier transforming spectra. So if we do that, uh, for instance, for this spectrum, we will have the response that an oscilloscope would see at the second antenna versus the travel time of the spin waves. So if we look at short times, just uh, here below, before one nanosecond, you see a first wave packet arriving and that's the fastest spin waves. And if you're patient enough, you wait two nanoseconds, you see a second wave packet arriving with a medium velocity. And then if you're even more patient, you see a slow wave packet arriving with a very slow group velocity, taking four nanoseconds to, to arrive. Okay, so, um, so this mathematical transformation that allows you to distinguish between the fast spin waves and the, and the slower spin waves, you can do it for one applied field, but you can do it for every applied field. So this is typically, uh, done. So these are frequency spectrum that are piled up for every applied field, applied transversely to the cobalt iron boron stripe. So this transformation that I could do for one spectrum to identify the fast and the slowest spin wave, uh, we can do it for every applied field. Okay, and you can see that the fast spin waves here. Uh, in fact, if you increase the applied field, you see that uh, they get slower. So they take, it, it takes them more time, more travel time to arrive at the receiving antenna. And that's also the case for the slow spin waves. They are slower and slower and slower as we increase uh, the applied field. Okay, so calculating the impulse response of the system is a way to sort the spin waves by their group velocity. So now that we know the, the, the travel time uh, so the arrival time of the different spin waves, uh, what we can do is isolate the contribution of every spin waves. Okay. So if we measure the full spectrum, so that's the raw data of a full spectrum, it contains many contribution. It contains the contribution from the different spin waves. It contains also some uh, electromagnetic coupling between the input and the output. And it also contains a lot of noise. And the first thing that is interesting to do when you make a propagating spin wave experiment is to try to suppress the electromagnetic coupling between the input antenna and the output antenna. And this is very easy because the electromagnetic coupling propagates at the speed of light, while the spin waves propagates at a few kilometers per second. So anything in your signal that arrives at time zero or let's say within less than a few picoseconds is related to the direct electromagnetic coupling between the input and, and the output. So if before the mathematical transformation, you remove the very, very fast electromagnetic waves, you will suppress the capacitive and inductive coupling between the input and the output. Then there's a second thing that is that it's interesting to do is to suppress a lot of the noise because if you think about it, the noise can arrive at the receiving antenna at any time. Okay. Whether the spin waves arrive at times that are related to their group velocity. So you can imagine that if the last spin waves arrives at eight nanoseconds, anything that arrives much after is just noise. Okay. So the first thing to do is to uh, gate your time domain curves and to recalculate the spectrum Okay. After having suppressed the signals arriving at zero delay and the late arriving signals. And you get these kinds of curve, uh, which are somehow much nicer because you've suppressed the baseline. And most of the people that do RF experiment know that baselines are usually strong and difficult to get rid of. Okay. And you can also see that you recover spectrum that have less noise if you, if you compare the, the noise in this black trace 
uh, to the noise of, of the raw data. So, okay. But then what you can do is also isolate the signal of only the fastest spin wave. Okay, so I gate my time domain curve to only keep the wave packet mm -hmm. corresponding to the fastest spin wave. I get this, this uh, green curve and I can do it for the medium velocity and for the low group velocity curve. So I can split my initial signal into let's say spin wave mode resolved transmission spectra. And if you look at each of these uh, spin wave resolved transmission spectra, you can see that they look like the single mode theory. So now you can treat these spin wave signals that are related to just one spin wave band to calculate or to measure experimentally, in fact, their, their dispersion relations. And as an illustration, I'll, I'll show it for, for, this, for this mode. Okay, so you can reconstruct experimentally the frequency versus the wave vector for a given mode. Uh, so this is, this is the bold curve, okay. And, uh, and for this geometry, so transverse fields and just one thick layer, uh, the theory is, is, is very easy and is well known. It's this curve with a, with a faint contrast. I hope you can see it. And you can see that indeed uh, this type of measurement is able to to measure the spin wave dispersion relation for a given band of, for a given spin wave band. And so uh, this is the end of my second part. I hope I've convinced you that propagating spin wave spectroscopy is a good tool uh, to measure the propagation characteristics of spin waves and indeed even to, to, to measure the band structure of spin waves. I have illustrated it on just one band, but you can do it on all the bands that are excited in your system. And so now what I will do is I will use these properties of the spin wave to make interferometry experiments and so applications to, to logic gates for, for wave computing. And uh, we will illustrate the possibilities of spin wave on an example that is a majority gate. So a majority gate uh, is a system where you have three inputs, P1, P2, P3, and one output, and you expect that the output has the majority of the inputs. Okay. And so if you implement that in wave computing, the face of the output should be the majority of the faces of the input, if the, and the face can be zero or pi. So in this type of experiment, uh, we will have the inputs that will be antennas. And the first thing to do is to choose a spin wave wavelength that exactly matches the antenna to antenna distance. So that if I apply a phase zero at the input, then at the output, I also have phase zero despite the phase rotation. So first thing is, okay, choose a frequency, okay, choose a field so that the, the wavelengths of the spin wave matches with the antenna to antenna distance. Okay. Um, so then if we emit a wave from the first uh, input and also a wave from the second input and a wave from the third input, if they are emitted in phase, then they will interfere constructively. The signal here is gonna be positive. And so the phase at the output will be the strong, uh, this is an absolute majority, let's say. Okay, the phase at the output will just replicate the phases at the input uh, and, and similar if I, if I make opposite phases at the input. So that's the strong majority case. If in contrast, one of the inputs doesn't agree with the two others, so it emits a wave that is opposite of phase, at the output, uh, the signal will be the vector sum uh, of, the, of the input, and it's still going to have a positive signal, so zero phase. So we can make a weak majority. Uh, so uh, that's how, uh, that's how uh, a majority gate is implemented in, in wave computing. You look at the phase at the output, and you, with respect to, to the phases at the input. So we'll, we'll try to do that with, with spin waves. Okay. Uh, so we will once again use our sample, which have four different antennas. Three of them is going to be the input, and the last one is going to be the outputs, so the majority port. Uh, and, and we'll do that uh, in, a, in an RF probe station and we'll, we'll VNA measurement technique. Okay. Uh, 
Um, I know you're tired at this moment, so I will, I will show you uh, what it looks like. So this is the scientist in charge on myself. Okay, and this is what the experimental setup looks like. So this is the probe station with the electromagnet. Here you have a screen of the microscope showing the device plus, plus the four different probes. And, and in order to do this experiment, we need to uh, have the control of the phases and of the amplitudes of the spin wave at each of the port. So we typically have step attenuators uh, here and delay lines to, to match the phases. Uh, so in practice, as I told you, the first step is to choose a frequency so that the wavelengths matches with the antenna to antenna distance. So in our case, I've taken a sample where the antenna to antenna distance is two micron, which means that we work at about 14 gigahertz. Uh, so there's a lot of calibration that needs to be done because we first need to align the faces uh, of the different spin wave signals at the different ports. And this is what uh, Giacomo Talmeri, the postdoc in charge is doing now is, is turning the so he's turning the phase shifters in order to have the same phases at, at all inputs. A second thing to do is to correct as much as possible for the loss of the spin waves upon propagation, okay? Uh, which as I told before are not so strong because we've taken very small, uh, uh, we've taken very small devices, but still we need to adapt because the transducers are not exactly the same. So we need to, to match the amplitudes of the spin wave at the input. So once you have done that, uh, you can try to um, measure the true stable of the majority gate. So you apply phase zero, phase zero at the three inputs and you measure the phase at the output. And you look at the eight different combinations of inputs to see if indeed you do have the, 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 the majority gate is, is working. Okay. So you, you select your magic frequency here, 14 gigahertz, and you apply the, the, the different inputs at, at, at the input gates. And indeed you can see that if I apply zero, zero phases at the input, the signal at the output is positive. And if two of the signals have zero phase, the signal is also positive. So we succeed to have strong majority and weak majority, and also weak majority for the inverse signal and weak major and strong majority for, for the inverse signal. Oof, so indeed, yes, uh, we can make spin wave majority gates uh, with spin waves, okay. Uh, but I will not stop there because in fact, uh, once you have uh, this, this device, there's a lot of fancy capabilities that you can evidence uh, with these kinds of, of majority gate. And the first one is that if you think of the configuration, all the antennas look the same. Uh, so the input and the output ports are fully interchangeable. So, so far I've decided to use the last antenna as the output, but I can also decide to use uh, an inner antenna as the output and just swap the cables, okay, in my experiment. So uh, I have optimized the majority gate for this configuration here. And if I just uh, change the role of the ports and measure without changing anything, anything else to true stable in this reversed configuration, then we still have, are able to identify majority, what strong majority and, and weak majority for both polarities. Of course, uh, the, the system is not so well matched uh, because of the because of the non reciprocity of the waves, okay. So emit here, the waves are all propagating in the same direction. While here, the wave from port one to output is propagating in the other direction uh, than the other ones, okay. And also the propagation distance are slightly different, so there's additional losses. But still, it works. You can in, you can reverse. You can use any antenna as the output of the calculation. And I, I've checked it indeed for the, for the four configurations. Okay, and uh, that's the, somehow the beauty of wave computing. Huh? If you, okay, as an electrical engineer, uh, if I had to design a CMOS circuit where we could, uh, where we would not need to specify which uh, of the electrode is the input and which of the electrode is the output, I would 
be in, I would be in a very difficult situation. So that's the beauty of wave computing. Okay, another feature that is that is uh, that belongs to spin wave is, as I told you in my introduction slide, uh, in the in the range of a few gigahertz, uh, you can both work with spin waves that are have large wavelengths or go deep into the submicron regime. Okay. So in this slide, I will just show two true stable. One of them is measured in a, in a spin wave conduit that is submicron, and one other is measured in a large spin wave conduit, but the wavelength of the spin wave if, is, is submicron. And in both cases, so submicron, uh, submicron majority gate or uh, uh, macroscopic majority gate, but using submicron wavelength spin waves, you, you can reconstruct uh, the, the majority gate and, and it's working. Okay. And the uh, last thing before, before I, I end my talk, I, I, I hope I'm in time, uh, is that in fact, because it's wave computing and because the calculation is based on interferometry, in fact, you can use your circuit uh, for at many different frequencies. So, so far what I've described is a situation where the antenna to antenna distance is exactly the same as the spin wave wavelengths. But, uh, and the idea was that the phase at the input is replicated at the, at the output. But you can achieve exactly the same situation if you multiply the, the wavelengths by an integral number, by two, three, four, and so on. So if you have a physical system that is able to implement the majority gate for, for, for these wavelengths, any harmonics of the same wavelengths should also work. And so uh, when we calculate the, so that's a calculation now, uh, the response of the gate, so far, we focused on a region near 13 gigahertz, okay, where we could uh, have a major, strong majority, weak majority at, at this frequency. If you go to higher frequency, then the wavelength is gonna be half of it. And we could in principle still implement another majority or the same majority gate function, but at a different frequency. And in fact, this is not the only thing you can do. Because if now, instead of increasing the wavelengths, you start to, you decide to decrease the wavelengths of the spin wave by a factor of two, if you have a phase zero at the input, you have a phase pi at the output. So effectively, the signal that arrives at the output is a not gate multiplied by the input at, at port one. While for the second port, uh, it's the phase is, is replicated. So now, instead of doing the calculating the majority of P1, P2, and P3, you simply calculate the majority of not P1, P2, and not P3, uh, so which is, which is a minority gate. And this should appear at frequencies that are below the frequency on which we demonstrated the first majority gate. And indeed, if you do the calculation, so that was the frequencies for the majority gate, and the frequency for the minority gate should be different, okay, uh, and intermediate, but we should still be able to see a, a, a strong minority and a, and a weak minority at this frequency and at this other frequency. So that was for the expectation. Is it working in practice? Yes, somehow. Okay, so that's, that's the corresponding experimental result. So the majority gate we focused on so far is this majority gate at, at 13 gigahertz. Uh, if you double the wavelengths, there is another majority gate that is, that is working where you clearly distinguish the strong majority, weak, min, uh, weak majority. And at intermediate frequencies here, here, and there, you do have the minority gates uh, with clear distinction between uh, the, the strong case and, and the weak cases. So indeed, uh, okay, uh, it's something very interesting about this wave computing and now it's implemented with spin waves, but uh, it's something that is very interesting is that for the same physical implementation, the same circuit, you can work at several frequencies. So you have frequency multiplexing for the same logic operation. And for other sets of frequency, you, have, you can have different logic gates. So this, this could be a way uh, in a futuristic view to have uh, superscalar architectures.
And with this, I'm, I'm going to my final summary. Uh, so spin waves are interesting for applications because they lie in the gigahertz range and they can have micron wavelengths and you can vary that easily. Uh, historically, they've been measured by fMR and by braille wire light scattering. Okay, but, but more recently, uh, a method has been developed which is propagating spin wave spectroscopy that is very powerful to calculate the dispersion relations of spin waves. And uh, if we harness the spin waves in the magnetostatic surface configuration, uh, then we can make spin wave interferometry experiments and we can construct uh, logic gates that have very specific features. So submicron operation, interchangeable input and outputs. I did not talk about it, but you can also factorize operators. Uh, factorizing operators is that, for instance, it's easy to concatenate in a physical device not gates and majority gates, so you can factorize operators and, uh, and you can achieve frequency multiplexing. And uh, with this, I, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>